Hello, everyone. We're going to start now. Let me just pull up everything in place so I have at least a few faces um, uh, yeah, in front of me. Hello, um, welcome to this FEM intro. Um, it's so good to see you all and to see at least read a few familiar names and faces from all over. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Elizabeth. And I am the regional director for the World Youth Alliance and usually based in Brussels. Um, I'm responsible for the European region, but because of our current situation and the current times, I am not in Brussels right now. I'm actually in Vienna, where my family is and where I'm usually on my own. Um, and I'm re-moderating this event today. So just for as an introduction, I know you've all read the application form and the general idea of what this uh, introduction is about. So we were gonna be talking about FEM, which stands for Fertility Education and Medical Management. And FEM is a partner organization and affiliated organization health program of the World Youth Alliance. Um, and today's presentation will be held by me, but uh, by one of our FEM teachers, which I, who I'll introduce in just a minute. Um, but before we go into some more details, I wanted to get some house rules out of the way. So from my own experience, we've been hosting online events for the past couple of months uh, quite on a regular basis. And being a speaker, it's very useful to have at least a few faces with the videos turned on. So those of you who have the possibility, have the, bread, um, the good internet connection to make that possible, please turn on your video so that our wonderful speaker Ginny will see at least a few reactions when she speaks. Um, also, you won't be able to turn on your um, audio, so you will, right now you'll be muted, um, but you will have the chance to ask any and all questions just as they occur to you during the presentation. I will filter through them, and if they haven't been answered at the end, they will, I will include them in our Q&A at the very end of the discussion after Ginny's presentation. So if you have a question about anything that she talks about or anything that she says or want more detail on one of the few things that she mentions in her presentation, just write it into the chat function and I will keep an eye on it and mention that question at the very end. So before I introduce Mel, uh, Ginny, I wanted to uh, say a little bit about myself as well. So apart from the uh, World Youth Alliance, I've been a part of the World Youth Alliance for a very long time. But the one thing that really brought me back to the World Youth Alliance after I finished my studies was really FEM. So the idea of this program that connects and makes me personally understand better how my hormonal health is connected to my overall health um, has been a complete game changer for me and how I treat myself, how I treat my body, etc. So I did the teacher training when I did an internship in New York City. Uh, and then I came back to Vienna and worked for a different NGO and started teaching FEM on the side for just a couple of friends. In the evenings, I had them over, we had a glass of wine and I gave a FEM presentation and then we had discussions. Um, so that was my personal FEM journey in a way. Of course, as the regional director for the World Youth Alliance, I'm still very much involved in trying to get FEM uh, more integrated and more present within the European region. Um, and even when I leave the World Youth Alliance, FEM will always be a part of what I do, I'm sure. So uh, without any further ado, I want to introduce Jenny Miller. She is a registered nurse and a FEM education manager. So please, Ginny, if you would turn on your microphone. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am so excited to be here with you all and be giving you this presentation. Um, and just like Elizabeth, I really had a similar experience with FEM once I learned the FEM teaching. And it helped me really understand how my hormones were connected with my body and the symptoms I was ex experiencing. Um, I really finally got the diagnosis and treatment that I had been searching for for so long. So that led me to want to work for FEM and now I am their education manager. So um, really, I hope that this presentation starts um, the conversation with you thinking of how your body is all connected and how your hormones are affecting your overall health. So now I'm just gonna share my screen with my presentation. And Okay, so 
FEM is going to help you hopefully take charge of your own health. And so this is just an introduction to FEM. Um, we're gonna dive into the anatomy and physiology of the reproductive system and how FEM, um, our app and how to chart. So as Elizabeth said, FEM is um, an acronym for fertility education and medical management. Um, it's a comprehensive women's health program that teaches women to understand their bodies and how to recognize hormonal and other vital signs of health, provides women with support through its free FEM app to help women track their health and reproductive goals, and through our medical management side of FEM, um, help provide accurate medical testing and treatment based on new research and medical protocols. And so FEM helps women to gain a basic knowledge of female reproductive anatomy and physiology and understand the role of hormones in the cycle. Then build on this information to be able to chart biomarkers and the FEM app as a means of monitoring um, your reproductive and overall health. And so our body works as one whole integrative system. So that means that your reproductive health affects the health of the entire body and your reproductive health is controlled by hormones. And so FEM focuses on four hormones, um, particularly there are over, I want to say like 50 or 100 hormones in the body, but FEM focuses on the main four that affect your reproductive system specifically. Um, and so the first two are FSH and LH, which are from the brain. And the hormones from the brain signal to the ovaries to develop an egg and release estrogen and progesterone, the two hormones that are from the ovaries. And this, um, and each hormone must reach sufficient levels to stimulate the release of the next hormone. And so first um, we're gonna look at FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. Um, and so this chart above is going to show you what's happening um, on the level of the follicle. Um, and below is what is happening on the hormone um, activity level. So FSH, um, this is exactly what it does. It's follicle stimulating hormone. It stimulates an egg that is contained in a sac called a follicle in the ovary to grow. This growing follicle then produces estrogen. And so as it continues to grow, the levels of estrogen increase. And as estrogen reaches peak levels, it produces, um, it tells the brain to produce LH, which is luteinizing hormone, which is named for the action that it does as well. Um, it luteinizes the follicle to trigger the, ma the mature egg to ovulate. And that is shown right here. So ovulation is when the egg is released from the follicle. And so after ovulation, this empty follicle here now is turned into what is called the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum is going to produce progesterone. So you can see from this chart that um, over a course of your cycle, that all of these hormonal fluctuations occur and that is normal and that is healthy. And each hormone has to reach sufficient levels in order for this process to take place. And so this brings us to um, a major point in FEM teaching is that ovulation is a vital sign of health. And ovulation is a vital sign of health because this means that your hormones are functioning correctly and are in the right place at the right time, which means that the whole body is working well. And so this is why it's vital to be able to identify a woman's signs of ovulation or detect signs that ovulation is not occurring. And so now we're just going to look at what is going on um, on the ovarian side. So we just looked at all the hormonal activity. And so now this is a zoomed in picture of the ovary. Um, and so first, like we said, FSH is released from the brain and it starts to stimulate this follicle to grow. And as this follicle grows, it produces increasing amounts of estrogen. Estrogen is then signaled to the brain to release LH, luteinizing hormone, which luteinizes this follicle to rupture 
And that is what causes ovulation. And again, ovulation is that release of the egg into the fallopian tube. And so after the egg is released and see this follicle is empty, this is the formation of the corpus luteum. And this is what is going to produce progesterone. And so in a normal cycle, um, if fertilization doesn't occur, meaning if a sperm doesn't meet the egg, then the, um, the egg will deteriorate in 12 to 24 hours and the corpus luteum will only last about two weeks. And once this deteriorates, your hormone levels fall and this is what causes menstruation. Now, what happens if um, implantation or fertilization occurs? So the egg will travel the fallopian tube and sperm can actually reach the tube within 10 minutes. And so once fertilization occurs, it takes four to five days for the um, fertilized egg to now travel the length of the fallopian tube. And then an additional one to two days for it to implant into the uterus. And so one in it, once it implants into the uterus, um, a hormone known as HCG is produced from this growing um, embryo. And it tells the brain, hello, I'm pregnant. And the brain then tells the corpus luteum, hey, stay intact. We have to produce progesterone so that we can continue this pregnancy. And so the importance of the corpus luteum is that it actually maintains the amount of progesterone needed until the placenta is formed at 10 to 12 weeks of pregnancy. So that means if you are not having sufficient progesterone levels or you have a malformed corpus luteum, then you are not going to be able to maintain a pregnancy. And this is what happens in miscarriages or what um, impairs someone from being pregnant to begin with. So again, um, all these hormones are so important and they all require each other in sufficient amounts to then work properly. And so, yes, ovulation only occurs once each cycle and the egg only lives 12 to 24 hours. Um, in the case of twins, um, what happens is two follicles um, synchronously grow at the same time and are released at the same time. So it doesn't happen days apart in case of twins. You can't ovulate once, you know, and then ovulate three days later. You can only ovulate once per cycle. And so estrogen and progesterone um, are really major hormones that not only influ influence your reproductive health, but also influence your general health. And so healthy hormone function is vital to well-being. And so here's a chart. Um, I'm not going to go over every, every part, but um, the main point is that um, estrogen and progesterone are needed in sufficient amounts to balance each other out. They have a balancing act. And so as you saw from the chart earlier is estrogen increases and then it decreases and then progesterone increases. So they aren't um, in high amounts, in high amount of levels at the same time. They're, um, you know, it works in this way because estrogen, um, it proliferates, it tones and it forms while progesterone normalizes and relaxes. So they are needed to balance each other out. And so the uterus and the cervix respond to changing hormones throughout the cycle. And so we're gonna see specifically how estrogen and progesterone influence the uterus. And so right here, um, just in case, you know, sometimes people need a refresher in anatomy and physiology, right here is a little diagram and, um, has my mouse. Um, and it, this right here is your uterus. Right here is your cervical canal. And here is your vaginal canal. Um, so just a basic anatomy um, in this chart is showing um, on the top, it's showing what's going on on the um, ovarian side. This is your ovaries, your ovarian side where the follicle is growing. This is the hormonal activity. And right here is the uterine lining. So this outside part of the uterus. So what we have is down here, um, this is when menstruation occurs. And so menstruation leaves the uterine lining thin and underdeveloped. And so as, as estrogen increases, 
it starts um, building up and proliferating the uterine lining. And as you can see, when it gets to peak levels, it's about um, at the peak thickness that it will get. And so once um, ovulation occurs, again, ovulation is the release of the egg. Once ovulation occurs and progesterone takes over because the corpus luteum is formed, then, then progesterone then maintains the uterine lining. And what it does is that it furthers it in the quality because what we need, the point of this uterine lining is to maintain a pregnancy. So we need to make sure that this uterine lining is a great quality, it's thick enough to support a pregnancy. And so that's how these hormones influence the uterine lining. Um, and one thing I wanna point out is, so from the time of menstruation to um, ovulation is known as the follicular phase because it is the development of the follicle. Whereas after ovulation, until your next period is known as the luteal phase because it is the time that is dominated by the corpus luteum secreting progesterone. And so our next slide is now showing how progesterone and estrogen influence the cervix. And so on the top again, we have what's going on on the ovarian level. Um, and here in the diagram, this is the cervix. So this is what is um, the hormones are acting on. And on the bottom, we have cervical mucus that is produced by the cervix. And this is the microscopic um, view version of what is that mucus looking like. And so, yes, the cervix produces mucus um, and our hormones affect what that mucus quality is like. And so estrogen, um, as it rises, rising estrogen, causes um, moist mucus. And this mucus looks almost like loaves of bread. And so FEM refers to this mucus as EL for estrogen and loaves. So EL mucus, and this is a moist mucus. Um, and as estrogen increases and reaches high levels, um, it produces a stringy mucus that is has characteristics that is slippery, clear, abundant, stretchy, and it looks, and so under a microscope looks like strings. And so FEM refers to this mucus as ES mucus. And so once ovulation occurs and hormone um, estrogen falls and um, progesterone begins to increase, it produces this dense, thick, um, dry sensation type mucus, which is referred to as G mucus, for gestogenic. And so that refers to pregnancy. Gestogenic is pregnancy because progesterone is the dominant hormone that is needed for the main maintenance of pregnancy. So actually, and so that brings me back. So after, um, after menstruation, when hormone levels are very low, your body has residual progesterone, which then produces G mucus. So that is what this low progesterone is, is um, going on over here after menstruation. So low progesterone, you still have the G mucus, dense, thick, scant. Then as estrogen rises, you get this EL mucus that is moist. As ovulation approaches um, and estrogen levels are high, you have a clear, slippery, abundant, stretchy, mucus, um, and that is ES mucus. And then as estrogen decreases and progesterone takes over, it again produces that G mucus. And so observing and charting the hormonal changes of the cycle are vital for you to understand what is going on. And so here we have, um, we have the microscopic versions, the symbols that FEM uses, um, the what is going on on the level of the uterus. And so now we can have like a good picture and the colors that we use. And so, um, so during menstruation, the uterine lining is shedding and this is going to be used by the color, shown by the color red as um, hormone levels are still low and before um, as FSH is trying to get that follicle to grow we have this dense, 
thick G mucus that forms a barrier and that is going to be felt as a dry sensation as um, estrogen increases and it forms this EL mucus. It's kind of this moist mucus um, and that's rising estrogen. And then now it goes as estrogen is at peak levels, it's going to reduce ES mucus, which is going to be this clear, slippery, abundant, stretchy mucus, and that is dark blue. And then it goes back to G mucus as progesterone becomes the dominant hormone again, and that produces a barrier. And so each of these um, mucus qualities are for purpose. So during times of G mucus, it actually works as an antimicrobial layer and works to um, block bacteria and sperm from coming into the cervix. And so this is a time of G mucus is a time of infertility. And so as you can see with the EL mucus, the cervix becomes a little bit more open and EL mucus actually um, filters out malformed or slow moving sperm. So sperm can still travel up their cervix, but it's going to filter out any bad sperm. And then ES mucus, as you can see, the cervix is open and the stringy quality of it actually is to help sperm move up the cervix. And so times of EL and ES mucus is times of fertility for a woman. And so um, hormones obviously rise and fall throughout the cycle. And so below we have now what is going to look like a charting of a woman. And so um, after menstruation, usually, but not always, there is a period um, or time of dryness. And then as estrogen rises, we will see a change to EL mucus and then a progression into ES mucus, meaning approaching ovulation. And then ovulation occurs and we see a change from ES to G mucus until the corpus luteum deteriorates and menstruation, menstruation occurs. And so this change from dryness to either moist or very fluid, stretchy, clear, slippery mucus is called the point of change and is the onset of the fertile time during the cycle. And can it can be a change from dryness to either EL or ES mucus. So some women don't see this EL mucus, they only see ES and that's perfectly normal, that's perfectly fine. Um, it's about finding out your own patterns. And so your peak day is the last day you observe ES mucus. What happens is um, your estrogen peaks causing ES mucus observations. And once ovulation occurs, the corpus luteum forms and the rapid increase in progesterone causes the ES mucus to dry up and produce G mucus. The count of three days after peak day covers the estimated time of ovulation and the lifespan of the egg. Infertility then begins on the fourth day after peak day and lasts till menstruation. Um, however, studies have shown that women ovulate within three days before or three days after peak day. However, we do the, um, because you already know that you are fertile during times of estrogenic mucus, estrogenic mucus being ES and EL mucus, um, since women already know they're fertile during these times, we count the P plus three. So because we are covering the time that ovulation could occur and again, the lifespan of the egg. And so again, it is an abrupt change from ES mucus to dryness. Um, occasionally, a woman will have an abrupt change from ES mucus back to EL mucus, and this is just due to um, the cervix is dissolving that ES mucus as well as building that G mucus, and that kind of causes um, this EL mucus appearance to occur, but it really is their change from ES mucus to the start of dryness. Um, and again, when you are charting, you, it is confusing at first, but you build on your patterns and you over time becomes more clear. And so this is 
just a chart um, that further um, now can you can separate you can actually see what the characteristics of each mucus quality is like um, on the app there are three symbols for mucus ob observations um, so this little cactus will be any times you observe cloudy thick or scant mucus and that is a sensation of dryness so you don't feel anything other than dryness and you will chart that as gray or this little cactus on the fm app and then um, these little waves um, is simple for rising estrogen or that EL mucus. And that is just a sensation of moistness. If then you observe any, any mucus that is clear, thin, stretchy, abundant, or feels like the sensation of fluid or slippery, you're going to chart um, this little guy falling. And that is ES mucus. And so um, again, these is um, the blue is estrogenic type mucus, if I ever refer to estrogenic. Um, and FEM teaches to, you will chart the most estrogenic sign of the day. And I will get into that a little later. So some women may notice sticky, cloudy, um, no fine thread um, mucus. And this will be charted as yellow. Um, or this little, um, I don't really know what that is, um, but it'll be charred yellow on the app. And sometimes, again, near the point of change, you might notice pasty mucus, which is a result of the G mucus dissolving or and mixing with the EL mucus. Or it could be due to normal cellular sloughing and secretions from the vagina, cervix, endometrium, um, cellular proliferation from low level estrogen or it could be a sign of inflammation. If you don't normally um, observe yellow mucus, um, it could be a sign of inflammation or infection. Um, and if you are having yellow mucus accompanied by a bad odor, itching, burning, any of that, um, then that is definitely a sign of infection. So charting your biomarkers um, and symptoms help you to keep a personal health record. And the FEM app enables you to input um, daily information about your health, your physical and emotional symptoms and hormonal observations. And it will then give you personalized feedback about your health, your body and the health choices you want to make. And so um, here we have what it will look like on the app to chart. And so menstrual cycle, by the quality that you experience, um, heavy, medium, light, spotting, or brown. Um, and heavy, heavy bleeding is constituted by if you use five or more regular tampons or pads in a day. Um, medium bleeding is three to five regular um, or regular tampons or pads in a day. And light bleeding is one to three regular tampons or pads used in a day. And spotting is anything less than light bleeding. And then obviously if you experience any brown bleeding, um, we want you to chart that. Um, and when then you will observe, um, chart your muc cervical mucus and your observations. And like I said, um, because there are so many qualities of ES mucus, you can experience any one of them. If you experience anything that's slippery, slippery clear, moist, or stretchy, you're just gonna chart that as this slippery guy. So any qualities of the ES mucus, you will chart as slippery in the app. And so um, FEM also allows you to um, track your, any symptoms you experience, um, whether it be emotional, physical, any medications you use, um, anything that's not included um, in the physical, emotional side, you can chart in the notes section. Um, and so FEM, the app is really, I'm cool because it um, allows you to customize what you would like to chart. Um, so if you are not using the LH test um, or pregnancy or the basal body temperature, you can just not include that in um, the part of the app. So if you really want to focus on your physical and emotional symptoms, then you can just have that open. Um, FEM also allows you to make notifications available for you. And we suggest that you um, have your notifications turned on at night to chart. And I will get into that in the next slide. 
So how to observe and how to record. So the first day of menstruation marks a new cycle. Um, and the FEM app will do this for you. You don't have to say a new cycle it will chart. As soon as you chart your bleeding for um, your new cycle, it will start a new cycle. Um, but that is just an important thing to note. Um, you may observe different types of mucus throughout the day. Um, and this is why I said to chart at night or FEM recommends to chart at night, because um, this is just an example, but say in the morning you wake up, um, you were lying flat. So your cervical mucus wasn't really brought down during the night. So you may wake up and it might be dry. And then your normal walking um, gravity throughout the day will bring your mucus down. And then you may observe um, some ES qualities. So that night, even though you experienced dry mucus in the morning and then ES mucus in the afternoon, you're going to chart the most estrogenic mucus. So you're going to chart that ES mucus or EL mucus. If you had a moist sensation towards nighttime, then you're gonna chart that point. So that is why it's so important to chart at night. Um, so yes, so set your notifications for night. Um, again, we want you to record any symptoms um, you experience and comment in the notes section, any medication you take anytime you experience illness because actually times of illness um, and medication can affect your cervical mucus qualities. And um, a really great example that I like to give is um, if you are having allergies or having a cold and you take um, like a decongestion to dry up your, um, your mucus in your nose, well, it actually works on the cervix to dry up your cervical mucus. So again, these things that you don't think are relevant um, are because your body works as one whole integrated system. And I can't stress that enough. So um, things you might not realize affect your reproductive health do. Um, for hygiene reasons, um, FEM also recommends when you, when you go to the bathroom and you wipe to wipe front to back. And that is because um, women have their vaginal opening, your, your urethra, urethra close to their anus. And so um, wiping front to back just um, puts you at less risk for infection. And that's why women um, usually have more UTIs than men um, is for this reason. So we recommend doing this for hygiene reasons, but also when you wipe front to back, then you are wiping over your perineum, which is the skin um, that you'll feel but that is between your urethra and your anus. And so this is where you'll feel the sensation of your cervical mucus. And FEM also teaches to only um, do external observations. You do not need to do internal observations. This will introduce bacteria and also confusion um, and put you at an increase or infection. So you don't need to worry. The regular motion of your day and gravity will bring your mucus down. And if you're wiping front to back, you'll be able to feel the sensation and be able to notice any mucus, on, um, any mucus observations on um, your piece of toilet paper. So um, don't worry, you will know your signs. Um, that's one thing I like to um, reiterate to people. And so, um, so FEMS education classes covers the basics of a woman's physiology, hormonal activity, cycle variations, and their application to family planning. And so this was the FEM introduction of how to chart and um, the basics to FEM teaching. So if you continue to work with a FEM teacher in our other sessions, you would learn FEM in your health, you would learn how your hormones influence your own health and your own charting. Um, and then really then FEM expert is to learn to identify healthy patterns or health problems. So really um, the next sessions is diving into your own cycle, your own health um, and what's going on in your body um, and really understanding your hormones. And then the fourth session is FEM family planning. So learning how to manage your fertility. So when hormones are imbalanced or at insufficient levels, women experience negative symptoms such as skipping menstrual periods, bleeding with no apparent pattern, irregular long or short cycles, infertility, significant mood changes and anxiety, pain, PMS symptoms, or anxiety. Symptoms of hormone imbalances. And so this brings us to um, the pill. 
And so as we've discussed, a healthy cycle is a cycle where hormones fluctuate and are built up in sufficient amounts to trigger each other. The variability in your cervical mucus allows us to assess whether or not your hormones are sufficient. However, on a pill, on the pill, the contraceptive pill, a woman does not have these hormonal fluctuations. The cycle is controlled by constant influx of synthetic hormones. So her cycle is not actually a cycle at all. And the bleeding that women experience is a hormonal withdrawal bleed from the reduction of the synthetic hormones. So it's not a true period either. So hormonal contraceptives stall the natural hormonal process of the cycle. And um, Femme really likes to teach us because one in three women take the um, contraceptive pill because they are experiencing symptoms such as heavy bleeding, severe PMS, irregular cycles, um, which are all what we just went over are signs of a hormonal imbalance. And the pill, as you saw, does not restore hormonal balance. And this is why FEM has created their medical management protocols. And so the medical management um, of from FEM is through their partnership with the Reproductive Health Research Institute, which has created medical protocols that represent a woman that represent a turning point in women's healthcare as they standardize important advances in reproductive endocrinology, enabling um, accurate diagnosis and treatment. So this means that they um, have really come up with a comprehensive way to treat reproductive disorders, um, how to identify them and how to treat them naturally um, in the sense that they are not suppressing your hormones. They want to restore that natural hormonal fluctuation that is healthy. Um, and that is their goal. And so how they do this is they take a very... Um, comprehensive view of the woman. And so they do this by doing a full clinical history and complete physical examination. They do general laboratory tests. They um, look at your cycle charting. I mean, when was the last time, you know, you went to their doctor and they said, can I see your cycle chart? I mean, that just doesn't happen. Um, and as you can see through this whole presentation, that that is a huge sign of what is going on with your health. Um, they also um, take labs that um, is your basic hormonal profile and so, and they do um, an ultrasound as well. And so when um, should a woman be referred to medical management? Um, well, so the criteria is if you have three or more abnormal cycles in a year or two abnormal cycles in a row, or if you're experiencing extreme pain um, or extreme PMS symptoms or just signs of a hormonal imbalance that we covered earlier. And so what is considered normal? Um, a normal cycle length is from 24 to 36 days long with a luteal phase length of nine to 18 days long. And again, the luteal phase is the time after um, your last, um, your peak day, your last day of ES mucus until your next cycle. So that's your luteal phase. Um, that should be nine to 18 days. And so these, this was um, studied to be um, a great criteria of if a woman is having a normal, healthy ovulatory cycle. And if you are not sure, um, you know, you're not sure if you're having issues or you're not sure what's going on, um, this is where the FEM app comes in. And when you're tracking, it gives you personalized fees, feedback based on the information that you put in. Um, it will also, and if you work with a FEM um, teacher one on one, they will help you um, really chart. Um, They'll help you learn to chart like very accurately, and then they can assess your cycle and you know decide whether or not you should be referred to medical management. So, um, and you know if you're having a lot of problems, I do want to say that you can go on the FEM website and um, go and access medical management there if you are having pain or something that you know you know your cycles are irregular. Like I would just you know try to go on the website and look into it or work with a FEM teacher um, would be my recommendation. So that brings us to the end of our FEM introduction. I know it was a lot, um, but FEM is just a very powerful tool that will help you understand not only reproductive health, but how ovulation is a sign of overall health. Um, and I hope that you all feel empowered to get the FEM app and to start charting. Um, thank you guys so much. Thank you. I think everybody feels like applauding for sure. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Honestly, that was awesome. It's so interesting. So I've been giving these presentations um, for a while and I haven't heard an intro for a while either. So it's been super interesting to see. Yeah. Each teacher gives their personal spin on things too because of the things that fascinate you the most. Yeah. You know, um, when I first became a teacher, the thing that kind of threw me the most, and you mentioned it too, was this uh, fact that our, we, we are so used to thinking in like, um, parts in that way and forget that our hormonal health affects every single part of our body and so to think about that obviously this has a, like the cycle the up and down has an effect on whether or not I can reproduce but it definitely also has an effect on my mental health and my um, um, the way what I eat the way I feel my metabolism everything and that was for me really the what threw me the most and that's why I love that slide where it says you know progesterone estrogen and how it affects the different parts of the body you know the yin yang estrogen being like energetic and progesterone being like the chiller hormone it's one of my favorite parts of them for sure I, I love it I really love it all at first I was like oh cervical mucus like what <laughs> but then I learned that everything that it actually is like indicating of what's going on in my body and I was like oh my gosh, this is like amazing that we can, that everyone can learn this and everyone can figure this out. So yeah. I don't know. And I just love them. <laughs> it's kind of like when you first learn how to drive, obviously it's different in the US because you learn it earlier. <laughs> but it, I feel like when I first learned how to drive, suddenly you walk the streets and feel like, oh, this is so different. I see everything from a different perspective. Yeah. Very similar with femme, I think, for me. Exactly. <laughs> Cool. Okay, so we got quite a few questions already. Obviously, if anyone else has a great has a question, please post it here. I hope it won't be flooded away. I already wrote some down, but before we go into those questions, I also wanted to ask you. So, um, when you first learned uh, and became a fem teacher, what would you say was the thing that threw you the most, that kind of fascinated you the most, or what is the thing that um, your FEM students are like most excited about when you teach them? I think um, for me, I had done a lot of research into hormones before FEM and I had been, you know, Googling a lot of things. And what threw me was that, that this information was not accessible through all of the things that I had researched. So just that fact that like I had done so much research, yet I learned so much from the FEM teaching was just showed me that there was just this lack of education for women and just showed me that there was this lack of knowledge that we were getting. And so I was just like, wow, this is crazy. And cause I was already at a point where I knew that hormones like was influencing my health, but then to just realize, um, I think it was just also the balance of estrogen and progesterone really threw me for a loop because it was like, if you are not getting that balance then you are gonna have so many symptoms. And so something that, and then so for my like clients what they have really they'll, my um, one client, she's like, oh, I know, like I'm getting my period. Like I'm having all these symptoms. Like she knows her PMS system symptoms, like so to a T that she just like knows, but she's just like, I can't believe this is connected because before, um, before she would just, you know, have all these symptoms, not know what's going on, not connected to her period or not connected to her hormones. And then like, once she started charting, she's like, this all makes sense. Like everything makes sense. And so pretty much every single person that I've worked with, all of their symptoms that they have pretty much relate to their hormones. Like I have not had a person, honestly, that had like a symptom that wasn't related to their hormones. So yeah. that's what's like the, the craziest thing to me. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so I wrote down a few of the questions that, well, all of them. So um, Eunice asks, um, so she would like to know the signs of ovulation. Obviously, we covered those already. She asked it quite early on in the presentation. But she asked also about for women that have been where their cycle has been disrupted um, through family planning methods and how can they observe whether or not they're ovulating. So if you're having, um, again, this is where really coming into working with the femme teacher one-on-one -on -one so they can look because um, femme teachers are trained to look at charts and to really understand what's going on hormonally. Um, and so I would say that if you're not experiencing the um, normal, um, like I gave the normal ES mucus signs, like if you're not that, those signs are what um, is a sign of ovulation is those increasingly estrogenic mucus sim um, symptoms. So if you're not experiencing those, then there is a very high, high chance that you are not ovulating. So 
Um, I think a woman, a lot of women don't really think about the possibility that they are not ovulating, but it, if you are not experiencing those mucus symptoms, then you are not ovulating. And so that is when it's time to work with a femme teacher, um, go to um, femme medical management, and they will help you. Um, charting will also help you figure out which hormone is off because that is also other um, key to the equation is what hormone do we need to work on balancing? I mean, it could be both. Do we need to do hormone replacement for both hormones? Um, so if your cycle is thrown and you are not having, um, if, you know, if you went through that presentation, you were like, I've never experienced any of those mucus um, symptoms, then I would say that is a cause for concern. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so very much related to that, um, Paris asked, um, so how does an irregular menstrual cycle present and can a woman having irregular menstrual cycles get pregnant? Again, you already talked a little bit about the irregularity and so how short and long a cycle can be, but I think it, it, it's worth repeating maybe once because this is... Well, so um, I'll give you a case of a woman with... Um, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, it's a very common um, reproductive um, disorder. And so what happens with a lot of women with PCOS, they have very long cycles and um, not to get, because I know you probably don't remember everything from the presentation, but FSH needs to be released from the brain for the follicle to develop and grow and estrogen to be released to then LH be released and ovulation to occur. And so in PCOS patients, some PCOS patients don't ovulate at all. Whereas some, it just takes them a lot longer for them to actually ovulate. So, um, you know, they may ovulate very much later in their cycle. But again, as long as you're ovulating, then you're able to get pregnant. So that's where charting comes in is because in these, it's a really a case by case basis because some women, um, um, or if you have a short cycle, someone, some women actually ovulate very early in the cycle, like right after menstruation. And again, they're ovulating, so they could get pregnant. Um, and so just because you're having long or short cycles doesn't mean you are not ovulating per se. Um, it just means that a hormone is off. Like you're not having the, you know, you'll probably have some symptoms that are, you know, coming up that are saying there's a hormone off, but you are ovulating. That is a possibility. So again, that's where cycle charting comes in um, because you could be having a, you know, hormonal issue and you not ovulate or you could be ovulating. So I don't know if that answers this question, but yes, it's cycle, it's called cycle variability. Um, and you can ovulate and you can have a hormonal imbalance at the same time. Yeah, no, for sure. I think also the fact is, I mean, we say that ovulation is a sign of health or is, the, is a vital sign of health. I always like to think of the different hormones kind of like domino stones, you know, mm -hmm. that, like one has to be exactly the right distance from the next one for the thing to work. If one is even a little bit off, the next stone won't fall over and therefore the ovulation won't occur in that sense or you won't be able to keep up a pregnancy. So even when you have ovulated which is not as often like it does it's not as easy if the domino stones aren't in the right order mm -hmm. um but if you do ovulate but um the circus uh, like the, the the leftover shell the corpus lupium isn't long enough and your cycle isn't long enough then the idea of keeping up a pregnancy is very um hap yeah it's very difficult for your body and that's one of the major symptoms that i see in my clients who say that they have a difficult time getting pregnant they get pregnant but the problem of having a miscarriage because of the corpus luteum is very um yeah, exactly. um so um paula asked so with quarantine we don't move and walk like we used to and if that affects anything um well, it is taught that fem is the normal gravity of the day. So if you're if you're sitting, um, like if think about laying down versus sitting, the you know your body's in completely different um, position. So it will bring down that cervical mucus. Um, I would say my thing about quarantine and all of this COVID is that it has caused a lot of stress, and so stress is a huge inhibitor of. Um, hormone, regular hormone production, and just interferes, interferes with that process. So a woman might experience different cervical mucus symptoms because of stress, as opposed to just sitting more. Um, I 
if, if you're walking, like, you know, you have to walk to go to the kitchen, <laughs> you know, that walking is going to be sufficient enough to bring the cer um, cervical mucus down. So I would say no on the effects of like sitting and walking to cervical mucus production. I would say more things of like stress is what affects it. Yeah, stress, less of less, lack of <laughs> exercise for sure, because mm -hmm. to, like have a regular exercise also helps. Yeah. Yeah. So keep moving even during quarantine. Yeah. Um, okay, wait, there's one question though that I want to have at the very end because it's so fitting. Um, but then I want someone, Angela asks, um, in the bad cases of dysmenorrhea, so um, for non-doctor or fem um, teachers out there, that means having bad PMS, like actual pain um, before or during um, menstruation, is that always, what is, how is that indicative of a woman's state of health? So um, again, we need to look at her whole cycle, her whole, her whole charting. Um, but a lot of times women who are experiencing dysmenorrhea um, do have a hormonal imbalance most of the time because like we said, when you're having your hormones in their balance, then they're balancing each other out. And so PMS symptoms should be mild at like to say the least, you know, if not, um, I read a lot of studies that honestly that so that PMS, if your hormones are truly balanced, you shouldn't experience PMS like pretty much at all. Um, so yes, extreme signs of PMS or dysmenorrhea would be um, a signal of um, hormonal imbalances. Um, and a lot of time um, that comes from just on a hormonal level, if you wanna know further detail, usually that comes from progesterone not being um, in sufficient amounts because um, of the way it acts in the body. But most of the time, I would say that um, it comes from progesterone or um, overactive um, people who experience estrogen dominance. So those would be people who are not ovulating at all. And so they only have estrogen. And because if you think about it in a cycle, if you don't ovulate and you don't have the formation of the corpus luteum, you don't have progesterone. So in a cycle that you're not ovulating and you're mostly just having estrogen, that is it. Um, definitely a huge thing that also causes dysmenorrhea. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's also one of the things that threw me so much, as you said before, the lack of education in women, um, but also this tendency of doctors, but th th therefore women themselves being like, well, that's just part of how it works. That's what I've always felt. So why should it be different? <laughs> it's not normal. You should not be in extreme pain or extreme discomfort or ex experiencing like very extreme, like mood changes, depression, anxiety, like right before your period, like that is, is not normal and you should not have to deal with that. So like giving people, especially women, of course, this uh, capability of making informed decisions, not just like being informed decisions regarding, okay, maybe I should pay more attention to, I don't know how, what I eat and how I exercise and maybe that will make a difference, but also, just I won't believe everything or it will be just dependent on my doctor in that sense that I don't know what kind of questions to ask. And so that is definitely something that FEM does as well. Um, so we have not much time left. So the last question that I'm choosing is, uh, what are the requirements or process for applying to become a FEM teacher from uh, Bridget? It's very easy. Um, you go online um, to FEM's website um, and you go to take a class or and it, I think it has a tab to how to become a FEM teacher and really you just register for the next session. Um, there is no prerequisites. Um, you don't have to be a medical professional. Like you don't have to be a nurse or anything. Um, you can just be you know, normal person, um, <laughs> don't have to have a degree or anything. Um, and you can just take the um, FEM teacher training course, which I will say is a nine week course. Um, and you, it's not, I wouldn't say it's like labor intensive, but definitely like includes a lot. Like, you know, you're going to learn a lot and um, you know, it's like normal school. So it's very easy to apply. You just go register and that's all. Yeah. yeah it's not, it's very easy. You do it online. Um, you then do some practice teaching as well. Um, and after you've finished your education, um, my recommendation is trying to stay involved, maybe try help correcting some things or like um, just keep teaching so you can um, improve your own knowledge and just stay informed. And if you have the chance, maybe attend our medical management trainings. Those are incredible. We just had one online as well, which was amazing. Um, we will send the website and everything um, 
uh, later on, but if you want to take a look right now, it's just femhealth.org. I'll post it into the chat too. Um, so all of you can take a look. Um, well, before we go, I'd like to take wonderful pictures of us all. So those of you who can, please turn on your camera and don't hide. <laughs> 